Good afternoon. My name is Africa Dorame Avalos. I am the Pesticide Program Manager for the Intertribal Council of Arizona in Phoenix, Arizona. What we will cover today is what is a pesticide? What are the active and inner ingredients of a pesticide? Pesticide residues, cleaners and disinfectants, routes of entry, exposures and symptoms, PPE or personal protective equipment and decontamination site, selecting a pesticide, how to read the label, parts of the label, the LD50 and how that is determined, which is the lethal dose, uh, pesticide storage, uh, application of pesticides, some things to consider, and transporting pesticides. At the end, we will take a fun quiz just to, um, just for fun. A pesticide is any substance or mixture of a substance that is intended to destroy, prevent, mitigate, or repel any pest. So uh, you have pesticides and under that umbrella of pesticides, you have specific uh, types of pesticides. For example, herbicides, which kill um, un weeds and unwanted plants. Your insecticides, which uh, kills or repels insects, ticks and mites. Termiticides, uh, they kill termites. Rodenticides are used for rodents. Algicides. Fungicides, uh, they kill, kills mold, mildew, and fungi. Uh, larvicides. Uh, side is a word forming element meaning to kill in Latin. So again, a product is likely to be a pesticide if the labeling or advertising makes a claim to prevent, kill, destroy, mitigate, remove, repel, or any other similar action against the pest, or it indirectly states or implies an action against the pest, even if it has pictures of a pest on the label or draws a comparison to a pesticide. Active ingredients are the chemicals in a pesticide product that act to control the pest. Active ingredients must be identified by name of the pesticide product's label together with its percentage by weight. So for example, on the front of the label, you will always see what the active ingredient is, whether it's 2,4-D, boric acid, uh, diacinon, dicamba, uh, Malathion, DEET, I think I said DEET already, glyphosate, which is Roundup, and you will see uh, the percentage by weight as well. Often the active ingredient makes up a small portion of the whole product, and we will talk about inner ingredients. There are several categories of an active ingredient. You have your conventional, antimicrobial, and the biopesticides. Conventional are all ingredients other than biological and antimicrobial pesticides. Antimicrobials, which are substances or mixtures of a substance used to destroy or suppress the growth of harmful microorganisms, whether it's bacteria, virus, viruses or fungi on inanimate objects and surfaces. Biopesticides are types of ingredients derived from certain natural materials. And biopesticides are often uh, effective in very small quantities, and they often decompose quickly, resulting in lower exposures and largely avoiding the pollution problems caused by conventional pesticides. And when you use uh, biopesticides as part of IPM or integrated pest management practices, uh, they can greatly reduce the use of conventional pesticides. Inner ingredients are combined with active ingredients to make a pesticide product. Innards are chemicals, compounds, and other substances including common food commodities, for example, spices, herbs, 
coloring, beeswax, cellulose, or fake fragrance. So for example, um, the product Roundup, when it is applied, uh, sometimes it is a color blue. So that would be considered an, an inert ingredient. It can also act as a solvent to help the active ingredient penetrate a plant's leaf surface. For example, if a insecticide is being applied to an agricultural product, they can add oil so it can help seep to the ground or the soil as opposed oh. to being on the plant. That's a, that would be considered an inert ingredient. Um, it improves the ease of application by preventing caking or foaming. It extends the product's shelf life. It improves the safety of the applicator. It protects the pesticide from de degradation due to exposure to sunlight. And although the inner ingredients are not directly responsible for the action of the pesticide, as it is an active ingredient, they may be highly toxic. Inner ingredients range in their toxicity from non-toxic to highly toxic. Their toxicity also varies according to how they are taken into the human body. Quick question. When and where might you come into contact with pesticides or pesticide residues? People are exposed to low levels of pesticides every day you can be exposed to pesticides in a variety of places, including your home, at school, or at work. Pesticides can get inside your body from eating, drinking, breathing them in, and by skin contact. Residues can be on plants, in soil, in the air, while you're mixing, loading, or applying pesticides yourself, even responding to emergencies such as spills, handling labels or opening or open containers, checking pesticide storage areas and container collection events. The residues can also be on equipment, PPE and clothing. That's why it is very important to know how to properly remove your PPE. Did you know that cleaners, sanitizers, disinfectants, antimicrobials, Virocytes and serolins are considered pesticides. Why are disinfectants and sanitizers listed as pesticides? People often use the term pesticide to refer only to insecticides, but it actually applies to all the substances used to control pests. Do you recall uh, the previous slides uh, when I mentioned that any product that states that they kill any type of pests or fungi, bacteria, virus, if it makes that claim, it is considered a pesticide. Therefore, it has to be registered through the Environmental Protection Agency. Disinfectants and sanitizers, as well as insecticides, herbicides, swimming pool treatments, and even leaf defoliants are managed by EPA. Disinfectants and sanitizers kill bacteria, viruses and fungi. So in addition, the EPA further classifies disinfectants as antimicrobial pesticides because they are intended to disinfect, sanitize, reduce or mitigate the growth or development of microbiological organisms or protect inanimate objects, industrial processes or systems, surfaces, water or other chemical substances from contamination. And I just wanted to add that Dage is a common name. I wanted to add that Patty Tembrook will be presenting after this presentation on, on the end list, which is the disinfectant list. Um, that was a guidance that was um, uh, provided by EPA um, after COVID. Disinfectants. Many disinfectants require the use of protective gloves when using. Please read the label to see what PPE is required when using any type of disinfectants. Dirt, food, debris, and...
better can reduce the effectiveness of the disinfectant and should be removed prior to the use of it with a wet or dry cloth. One example is when you use hand sanitizer, you should make sure that your hands are clean prior to applying hand sanitizer for it to be effective. Whether the disinfectants are used in a medical or residential setting, they may not be used on surfaces that come in contact with food until the residual disinfectant is removed. Also, oops, sorry about that. My Surface Pro is very sensitive. Disinfectants, many dental or residential settings. Also, many labels clearly state keep out of reach of children. Some of the most commonly used ingredients are asthma triggers or skin and eye irritants. <laughs> Sorry about that. Routes of entry. Human exposure to pesticides can happen through four major routes. Pesticides can enter the body ocularly through the eyes, inhalation through the nose and respiratory system, dermally through the skin, or orally through the mouth and digestive system. Out of these four routes of entry, which one do you think is the most reported? It is the skin. The skin is the body's largest organ, accounting for more than 10% of your body. And it is the most common form of reported occupational skin disease. Exposures and symptoms. Pesticides can cause short-term adverse health effects called acute effects or acute symptoms as well as chronic adverse effects that occur months or years after exposure. Examples of acute health effects include stinging um, eyes, rashes, headaches, eye irritation, blisters, blindness, nausea, dizziness, diarrhea, and death. The symptoms of chronic toxicity may occur as a slowly progressive condition, such as increased breathing difficulty or skin sensitization. Uh, it could also be an allergy after repeated use of a pesticide. Sometimes chronic toxicity may result in a disease such as cancer. PPE and decontamination site. PPE is the last line of defense between you and the hazard. Personal protective equipment is used as a temporary or last line of protection for workers against hazards. The PPE you use will depend on the work environment, the work conditions, and the process being performed. It is very important to wear the right PPE, make sure that it fits right, as it does not reduce the workplace hazard exposure or guarantee permanent or total protection. When PPE is not enough, you should ensure the required level of protection. One, PPE should be selected considering the type of hazard and the degree of protection required. Two, PPE should be usable in the presence of other workplace hazards. Three, use, users should be trained in proper use and fit of the PPE. Employers are required to train each worker required to use PPE to know when it is necessary, what kind is necessary, how to properly put it on, adjust it, wear it and take it off, the limitations of the equipment, proper care, maintenance, useful life, and disposal of the equipment. If PPE is found to be defective, it should be discarded and replaced. Which one of these gloves do you think offers the best protection? We have chemical resistant nitro gloves, barrier laminate gloves, neoprene gloves, biton gloves. Just a few examples. One common misconception is that all chemical resistant gloves provide the same amount of protection from pesticide products. This isn't true because not, not all chemical resistant gloves are this, have the same thickness. 
The product label will always inform the user that glove material is necessary for safe handling of the product. But why do you even need gloves? Dermal exposure, remember, through the skin is the most common route of insecticide exposure. If you handle insecticides while not wearing gloves, you expose the skin on your hands along with anything else you might touch later. And for this reason, gloves should always be worn when handling pesticide containers, mixing or loading, and maintaining sprayers. Gloves should always be readily available when working with pesticides. And also know, you need to know how to properly uh, remove them and dispose of them. Selecting a pesticide. Selecting a pesticide. As mentioned earlier, pesticides consist of one or more active ingredients and, and inert ingredients. Active ingredients are the chemicals in the product that are actually meant to kill or repel the pest. Neonicotinoids or neonics are now the most widely used insecticide and the most studied class of insecticides for bees due to the decline of bees and other pollinators. Bees have been dying in alarming numbers across the country and a June 2019 study found that beekeepers had lost 40% of their honeybee colonies over the past year, and it was partly due to the use of pesticides. Organophosphates work by damaging an enzyme in the body called acetylcholinesterase. And I think I pronounced that right because I've said it over and over a few times. Um, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, is the most widely used herbicide. Bifenthrin is a synthetic pyrethroid and is the active ingredient in Telstar. I've seen Telstar used for bed bugs. Uh, the insecticide interferes with the nervous system of insects uh, when they eat or touch it. It comes in sprays, granules, and aerosols. The inner ingredients or other ingredients could be any substance other than the active ingredient and it could range from zero to 99%. Sometimes you could see 90% of inner ingredients and only 10% of an active ingredient. They are often emulsifiers, solvents, carriers, uh, aerosols, propellants, fragrances, and dyes. Selecting a pesticide. Things to consider when selecting general use pesticides versus restricted use pesticides or RUPs. General use can be purchased and used by the general public. So you have your home defense, your Roundup, your RAID that are sold at your local Walmart or Home Depot. Those do not require a license for personal use on an individual's property or uh, for distribution. <clears throat> RUPs will state restricted use on the product label as required by the EPA, and they may only be purchased and used by certified pesticide applicators or people under their direct supervision. Another thing to know is that RUPs, um, RUP applicators uh, working in Indian country do need to be federally certified to apply RUPs, and they need to be certified through um, the EPA region that they are that they are covered under. Selecting uh, broad spectrum and narrow spectrum pesticides. Broad spectrum uh, kills a variety of organisms, including some that are beneficial, in addition to the target pest. And narrow spectrum pesticides uh, only kill the organism for which it was intended to and does not harm other organisms. Select products that have the signal word caution instead of warning or danger. Select products that are packaged to reduce the risk of exposure or spillage. Select products for which safety data sheets do not indicate long-term long effects. Do not require more than the minimal PPE. So you have uh, specific categories. You have your danger, your warning, and your caution. Signal words, they are found on pesticide product labels and they describe the acute or short-term toxicity of the formulated pesticide product. 
the signal words can be either danger, warning, or caution. Products with the danger signal word are the most toxic. The warning indicates the pesticide product is moderately toxic if eaten, absorbed through the skin, inhaled, or it causes moderate eye or skin irritation. The signal word caution means the pesticide product is slightly toxic if eaten, absorbed through the skin, inhaled, or it causes slight eye or skin irritation. Determining the LD50. LD means lethal dose. The median lethal dose of a substance or the amount required to kill 50% of a given test population. It is a measurement used in toxicology studies to determine the potential impact of toxic substances on different types of organisms. The LD50 measurement is usually expressed as the amount of toxin per kilogram or pound of body weight. A lower value is regarded as more toxic as it means a smaller amount of the toxin is required to cause death. And it determines the toxicity category. So it determines the uh, signal word for each pesticide, whether it's danger, warning, or caution. And acute toxicity is measured by LD50 and LC50 values. The smaller the LD50, the more toxic the pesticide. So for example, a pesticide with an LD50 of five milligrams per kilogram is 100 times more toxic than a pesticide with an LD50 of 500 milligram per kilogram. Questions on how to mix. Why is it important to read the label? To protect your family, community, pets, and the environment to prevent accidents from occurring, to ensure proper and legal use of the chemical or the pesticide, to ensure proper storage and disposal of the pesticide, and know the appropriate number to call in case of emergency. It is important to read the label at least four times. One, before purchasing the pesticide, Always read the label carefully before you buy a product and make sure the product is intended for your specific use. Two, before mixing and loading, use the appropriate amount of pesticide for your job. Applying more pesticide than the label directions indicate can waste money and may harm people, pets, or the environment. It may even be less effective at controlling the pest. Three, before applying the pesticide, do not assume a pesticide purchased for one type of treatment can be used in another setting without first checking the label. Many pesticides have similar names and ingredients despite being intended for very different uses. Four, before storage and disposal. Buy only what you need. Storing and disposing of leftover pesticides can lead to unnecessary risks. Review the storage and disposal section of the label for information on how the product should be stored and disposed of, including the empty container. Does your, do the pesticides need to be stored in a temperature controlled um, environment? That's one thing to consider. Reread the label before So read the label to make sure you're uh, storing the pesticides properly. Types of pesticide formulation. Types of pesticide formulations. Common liquid formulations are emulsifiable concentrate, which is E or EC. EC formulations usually contain an oil-soluble liquid active ingredient, a petroleum-based solvent, and an emulsifier, which is a mixing agent. The emulsifier allows the active ingredient in the solvent to mix with water. These form an emulsion. ECs are versatile formulations that can be applied with many types of sprayers. Then you have your solutions. 
some pesticide active ingredients dissolve readily in a liquid solvent, such as water or a petroleum-based um, diluent. When mixed, they form a solution that does not settle out or separate. Formulations of these pesticides usually contain the active ingredient solvent, the carrier or the diluent, and one more, one or more uh, other ingredient. No emulsifier is required and uh, solutions are suitable for any type of sprayer and they're registered for many sites. You have your liquid flowables. Some active ingredients will not dissolve in either water or, or oil, so they are impregnated in a dry carrier such as clay, which is uh, ground into a fine powder. The powder is suspended in a small amount of liquid to make the thick formulation. Then you have your aerosols. These formulations contain one or more active ingredients and a solvent. Most aerosols contain a low, per low percentage of active ingredient. And there are two types of formulations. You have your ready to use aerosol formulations or RTUs. They're usually small self-contained units that release pesticide when the nozzle valve is triggered. Then you have your smoke or your fog generator uh, formulations that are used in machines that use a rapidly whirling disc or heated surface to produce and distrib distribute very fine droplets. Other types of pesticide formulations. Fumigants is a method that fills an area with gaseous pesticides or fumigant to suffocate or poison a pest with them. <laughs> Adjuvant is a substance added to a spray tank separate from the pesticide formulation that improves the performance of the pesticide. There are different types of adjuvants. You have, <clears throat> for example, anti-foaming um, agent, a buffer or pH modifier, <clears throat> a compatibility agent, which helps to combine pesticides um, effectively and they can reduce or eliminate mixing problems. You have adjuvants that drift um, control for drift control uh, you have an extender sticker which keeps pesticides active on a target for an extended period or on waxy foliage. And those are some examples of adjuvants. You have your dry formulas like your dust and your baits. Um, your baits are uh, mostly ready to use formulations containing an active ingredient mixed with food or another attractive substance. The bait either attracts the pest or is placed where the pest will find it. You have your granules and your pellets, uh, your wettable powders, sol soluble powders. Um, these formulations look like wettable powders. However, when mixed with water, soluble powders dissolve readily in water and form a true solution. And uh, micro encapsulated, which are released over a period of time. Uh, these are dry particles or liquid droplets surrounded by a plastic, starch, or other material coating. And they are mixed with water and applied as sprays. And then you have your dry flowables. Um, some active ingredients would not dissolve in either water or oil, so they are impregnated in a dry carrier such as clay. Uh, which is ground into a fine powder. Green cleaners. When you choose to use green cleaning products, you are making a vote to protect the environment and your health. Uh, most ideal green cleaning products are made using sustainable manufacturing practices and are naturally derived. They're safe, they're non-toxic, they're biodegradable, and they don't ne negatively impact the environment. Um, many companies now create cleaning products that use more natural ingredients uh, and avoid harmful chemicals. Of severe eye damage or skin irritation. So Let's read a pesticide label. If you happen to have a pesticide label uh, near you, or perhaps you can download one, um, the following information must appear on the front of the label. You have your brand name, 
which is uh, the name given by the manufacturer to the specific pesticide product. You have the company name or the manufacturer, the active or and in their ingredients. And so this statement lists all, all ingredients as a percentage of the, the total packaged product. You have the EPA um, registration number and establishment number, and whether the product is a restricted use uh, pesticide. This statement appears um, if the product is an RUP. This determination is usually based on the product's individual human toxicity or on chemical properties that may impact the environment. And remember that these products may only be purchased and applied only by individuals with a pesticide license. And this information is usually on the top front of the label. Then you have your signal words. The signal word indicates the acute toxicity, um, which occurs within 24 to 48 hours after exposure and the hazard of the pesticide to humans and animals. And it is, a, it is a quick way to determine the toxicity. So if it says danger, poison, that represents the most toxic of all pesticides. And these products also carry the risk of severe eye damage or skin irritation. So, you know, proper PPE is required. Then you have your warning, which represents moderate toxicity and uh, caution, which represents slight toxicity. You will also find on the label first aid instructions. And this statement describes emergency first aid in case of exposure to the product, which whether it's oral, skin, inhalation, or eye. And for more, tox for more toxic pesticides, the first aid statement must be on the front of the label with additional first aid information somewhere else. For less toxic products, the first aid statement may be in a different location. So it is a good idea to review the first aid statement before using a pesticide. And keep in mind that you can also refer to the SDS sheets. They're not called MSDS anymore, but they're called SDS, which stands for safety data sheets. Then you will have your precautionary statements. Uh, this section contains information about potential hazards related to the products use, including risks to humans, domestic animals, other non-target organisms, wildlife, and the environment. And these statements are based on the on product risk assessments. This section also lists the PPE required when using the product. Some precautionary statements relate to the product's specific chemical properties, and these statements may outline actions needed to eliminate risk of runoff, drift, or problems with hot or cold temperatures. The precautionary statements contain the following. So you have your PPE, um, the physical or chemical hazards, the environmental hazards, and whether um, the product is hazardous to bees. Proper pesticide storage, handling, and disposal. This designate individuals to handle pesticides. Train designated pesticide handlers on the specifics of handling, mixing, and applying the products they use. The EPA has a worker protection standard that was established for agricultural workers and handlers that are required to have training on an annual basis if they are handling or applying any type of pesticides. And it trains them how to uh, properly and safely uh, use those products. Uh, provide pertinent literature, for example, SDS, safety data sheets, hazard communication plan, SDS sheets contain information pertaining to properties of each chemical, physical, health, and environmental hazards, protective measures, safety precautions for handling, storing, and transporting the chemical. This, it has more information than the label itself. And it is intended for medical personnel in case um, you, you ever be, you know, someone becomes sick or exposed to that chemical, but it does have 
all of the information that you need to know about that specific chemical. Maintain proper storage of chemicals in inventory and store in the original containers and keep up to date inventory. You may have some gallons that are five years old and are you, do you think the, that chemical is still going to be effective if you're going to use it now? That's why it's important to only buy what you need. Ensure good ventilation and pesticide storage areas. This is a, a huge problem, especially in Arizona. There are some products that are required to be in, un, stored in a certain temperature. If there is no proper ventilation in a storage area and you walk in, guess what? You may be exposed to that pesticide by inhalation. Provide proper secondary containment in mixing, loading, and storing storage areas. Train personnel on proper personal hygiene and decontamination procedures, washing your hands, laundering clothes, etc. Enforce good housekeeping practices to reduce workplace exposure and accidents. Pesticide labels should always be visible on the original containers and SDS sheets should be maintained in an accessible space. It was mentioned earlier to always keep pesticides or chemicals in their original container. Why is that important? If you were to store a chemical in a different bottle, what color are some chemicals or most chemicals, green or blue? If you were to store that in a different container, what color are Gatorades? There are different colors. So that is why it is always important to store chemicals in their original containers. Existing buildings should be proper. And here are some examples of uh, pesticide storage facilities. Uh, just remember that safety is the key element in storing pesticides. Proper storage will protect the environment and the people who live and work near the storage area. Um, Proper storage of pesticides prolongs the chemical shelf life. It reduces the risk to people and livestock. It eliminates surface contamination, prevents groundwater contamination. It is best to build and or designate a separate building specifically for storage of large quantities of pesticides. If a separate facility is not possible, a precise area within an existing building should be specified for pesticide storage. Okay, so now we're just going to take a uh, fun little quiz and you guys can uh, write your answers in the chat box. Okay, I gave you the answer for that one. All right, so now we will go ahead and take a short pesticide use quiz to have a little bit of interaction amongst us. And if you can go ahead and type in your answer in the chat box, I can go ahead and read the answers. So what I'll do is I'll read uh, the question and give the answer. So the first question is, to prevent the spread of pesticides, it is best to mix the chemicals in an enclosed area. Is that true or false? Okay, everybody's getting it right because they saw my answer. Yay! And I'll give you a few minutes to answer. <laughs> All right, good job, guys. That is false. Mixing pesticides indoors can intensify the risk of exposure to toxic chemicals. It is advisable to buy the exact amount of pesticides needed for the job in order to prevent the storage of harmful chemicals. It is also important to find <coughs> the correct storage instructions mentioned on the label. Keep pesticides and any equipment used to apply them in a locked cabinet that is well ventilated, away from children, from your pets, from medicine, from food, and other toiletries. Never reuse a pesticide container. Next question. How can employers help lower the rate of pesticide exposures? A, through comprehensive training on each chemical and educating workers about their rights by letting workers learn about the risks on the job. 
by not letting workers know that they are working with toxic chemicals, or D, through short training sessions every two years. Okay, and the okay. answer is A. EPA has released guidance regarding the annual pesticide safety training requirements outlined, outlined in the Agricultural Worker Protection Standard, or WPS. It is not every two years, it is uh, on an annual basis now. And the WPS aims to reduce pesticide poisonings and injuries among agricultural worker, oops, sorry. workers and pesticide handlers. Good job, guys. Next question. What is the best way to prevent pesticide exposure? A, wear the same pair of clothes to work every day. B, apply first aid in case of exposure. C, use personal protective equipment. Or D, clean up spills immediately. And the answer is C. The most effective way to prevent pesticide exposure is by ensuring that the workers adhere to proper PPE, depending on the exposure and toxicity of the chemicals. Good job, guys. Okay, next question. Oops, 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 oops. The correct method of disposing of pesticides is by A, burying the chemicals in the ground, B, pouring the chemicals in the sink, C, flushing the chemicals down the toilet, or D, none of the above. That would be none of the above. Instead, you follow the exact disposal instructions on the label to get rid of leftover pesticides in empty containers. Adhering to proper disposal guidelines can protect the environment by keeping toxic chemicals out of waterways. Good job, everyone. Okay, next. If you are exposed to pesticides, you must A, get first aid treatment immediately, B, change your clothing, C, take some medicine at home. D, leave it, this happens frequently in me. Anyway, please remove your- Please don't answer D. Contaminated clothing and wash your skin with running water, rinse your eyes, and seek fresh air from the pesticide treatment area. Dermal exposure happens when your skin is exposed to pesticides, and this can cause the irritation or burns. In more serious cases, your skin can absorb the pesticide into the body, causing other health effects. Some pesticides evaporate more easily than others, so they are more likely to be inhaled. Remember um, that dermal exposure is the number one reported, reported exposure. And I'm gonna call out Peter early. You are wrong, Peter. You're gonna have to take one of my courses. <laughs> okay, I'll let that one slide. All right, uh, next one. Africa, we're running really short on time, I believe. Can we check with the moderator? Yes, let me check the time. Okay, let me um, go through these. I think this is the last one. So, okay, that's, so I'll skip the quiz. And I'm pretty much done, guys. I just wanted to give a quick overview of um, the talk. And we know what the four routes of entry are. Um, how many times should one read the pesticide label? And that magic number is four. And I know this picture, oops. So just remember. And although you did fix that bed bug problem with hundreds of bed bug bombs, just remember that pesticides are highly flammable or explosive and pesticides may give up highly toxic vapors or smoke that are very harmful. Okay. Thank you for your interest in this topic and attending this session. Again, my name is Africa Dorame Avalos. I am the Pesticide Program Manager for the Intertribal Council of Arizona. 
And if you have any questions, I can go ahead and, and take a few. Thank you so much and uh, be safe, be well, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you everyone for your time. And if there are any questions, I can go ahead and um, take them or we can, um, actually we can uh, go and move forward with Patty's presentation since we're a little short on time and then I can um, answer the questions in the chat box in the meantime. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Africa. That was awesome. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and switch to sharing my screen. And I just want to tack on to the end of that a um, quick, oh, let me do it this way. Do I have to stop sharing? OK. Right. No, I, I can just steal it from you. And let me know when you see that. PowerPoint. So I just want to talk a little bit. Um, Africa covered so many things. And one of the things that she talked about uh, was the antimicrobial pesticides. And in this time of uh, COVID-19, you've all been hearing a lot about disinfectants. And so I wanted to just go through a little bit about how to choose disinfectants um, that, that you can be pretty sure are going to work. <laughs> Um, and so uh, this is about disinfectants that are effective against the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Um, and I want to make one distinction here, just to be kind of clear, uh, between disinfectants and hand sanitizers. Um, disinfectants are what I'm talking about. These are regulated by EPA under as pesticides. Hand sanitizers are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, so I am not talking about those. So I just want you to keep that straight, and you shouldn't use hand sanitizers to do your surface disinfectant work, and you shouldn't use surface disinfectants as hand sanitizers. They're not, inter not interchangeable. Um, EPA has a nice infographic that provides these six steps to consider when you're, uh, how to use a disinfectant um, safely and effectively. One is to check that your product is EPA approved, which means it has an EPA registration number on it. It's on and to work against the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, it has to be on EPA's list of products, which we call list N, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, always read the directions very carefully. That applies to any pesticide. It's especially important as well for antimicrobials because you need to follow the directions regarding what kinds of sites and surfaces it works on. Um, and a common thing people might try to do is use a disinfectant on fabric and most of them are not effective on fabric. So read the label very carefully. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're uh, following all the safety instructions and a really important piece this is making sure, uh, well, that's on step four, the contact time. But step three, uh, after you read the directions, and I loved Africa's thing about reading the label four times, so <laughs> that works into this as well. Um, you always wanna pre-clean a surface that you wanna disinfect because if there's a lot of dirt on the surface, it will, uh, it will cause the disinfectant not to work as well. The contact time is super important. If you don't leave the disinfectant on the surface long enough, it won't work properly. It won't kill, get the virus or bacteria kill that you want. Um, if, wear gloves if the product says to wear gloves and wash your hands after you've used it. And make sure these are locked up and safe and away from children. They're not meant for children to be, it's children should not be given disinfectant wipes to use. They should, um, they're, they're, most of those should say, keep out of reach of children. They, they can be poison and cause problems. So I wanna, what I really wanna show you, again, this list N tool that EPA has is a, um, a way for you to look up and see if a particular product is, um, it will work against the virus that causes COVID-19. This is a new virus. So you're not, you, if, when this first broke out, you are not gonna see the uh, SARS-CoV-2 as they call it virus on the label because of, nobody knew about that virus. So EPA did some work to determine what among currently registered, um, among currently registered products, what would be uh, effective based on what viruses we do know it works again. Against and and in this you can you can download this presentation and this this is a live link down here that you can use to go to this tool. 
Um, and if you hit the launch button, uh, you get to a screen. Let's see if I might end up, I think I've frozen up. Let me try something different here. <clears throat> Okay, I seem to have frozen up. Try something uh, a little different again. And try this. Gonna take you to the tool live and show you online how it works. So here I am in the, in the um, actually online looking at this tool. And if I hit the launch button, um, let's see if it'll go for me here. Going to have to walk everyone through this who wants to. <laughs> oh, here we go. It comes to this screen where you can look up a product. Every product that's registered by EPA has a registration number. So, for example, you'll see a, uh, on the bottle it'll say EPA Reg number Reg No R E G dot N O dot, and it'll have a two part number. It might have a three part number, but the most important is the first two parts of the number. And if you enter those in here. And uh, I wonder, I don't know if I have, I don't have one handy, um, but you can also search by active ingredient. If you remember Africa talked about some of the products that are greener, um, there are products that have say citric acid as their, as the, um, as the active ingredient. That one is, is a minimum risk pesticide. And so if I choose that and then hit show results, There should come a list of products and here we go. And so now I get a whole list of, of products, the EPA registration number. And so you can compare that on any bottle or product that you're looking at and see that citric acid is the ingredient. The part people get a little confused about is there is a product name in here. There can, they can have different names. They can, different, different companies will sell these under different names. The important thing is to make sure this registration number matches up. And then you need to follow the instructions on the label for whatever organism is listed in this column. And then it tells you how long to leave the, the stuff on the surface. Um, so anyway, this is a way that you can ensure that whatever product you have that you wanna disinfect your surfaces with will be useful and effective against the coronavirus that causes um, COVID-19. So that is all I really wanted to share about that. Um, if I can find my way back to you guys. Here we go, I think. I have no idea if I'm still, <laughs> still in the Zoom meeting or not. Um, that's about all I have time for. Um, the presentation that's on that you can download will have my contact information, some other information about pesticide safety sites like the National Pesticide Information Center if you need help finding, um, oh, I see, there I am. Oh, I'm getting it back here. Okay, um, and so so hopefully you can find more information there. I think our session is about to run out. Um, and so uh, we, I guess we could take a question or two if there are any quick ones, but we'll have to read the questions from the chat and see if we can get back to you. Yeah, Patty, this is John Flores. Um, we're about at time, but this is the last session of the day. So it's not like we have to get off, you know, and we're constrained to that. So if anyone does have any questions or comments, now is the time to ask. Either you can unmute yourself and ask verbally, or you can type it into the chat box. If there are no questions, um, this will be available, like we said, on the website. Both presentations, uh, their PDFs will be available, as well as a recording of this uh, breakout session will also be available on the website. So just check on back there, um, you know, and it'll, you'll, you should see them either by tomorrow or the next day, and you can download what you would like. If there is nothing else, I'd like to thank our presenters uh, for their wonderful presentations today and for everyone who joined us. We had a pretty good, I think we had almost 40 people participate today in that, so it was a good one, a good participation. And um, thank you, Africa and Patty, and everyone have a nice day and a nice evening.
Thanks all.